Good morning. Now we make connection. Hey, this is great to see you here this morning. We're seeing several new faces and you guys that go out and use those recreational trails, I can tell. So thank you for being here. Um, like I've said to a few of you, we've been doing forum for we think 14 years. We do 50 programs a year. So if you would like to be on our email list so that you get those emails saying what's coming up and maybe you can determine what you want to come listen to and what you don't, that's great. Okay, just let one of the, Kathy's in the back, maybe somebody let us know and we'll get you on that list. If you ever have suggestions of programs you'd like to hear, please let us know. <laughs> and see if we can work it out. In some ways, you guys, this has been like herding cats. I don't think I will again ask six people to come speak on the same morning. <laughs> Getting everybody's schedules to agree and all of that. But I want to do a quick introduction and then we're going to get into some presentations and then some question and answer at the, at the end. So starting because she's up here, this is Renata Raziano. She's with MUT, which is Montrose on Compatible Trails, and Cop Moba. Okay? Then, however this happens, Frank Holland Donner is with Uncompatible Valley Trail Riders, Yay. which is, I consider mostly uh, ATVs, uh, but I think they have your snow machines as well. Snowmobiles. <laughs> uh, Jamie Nance, West Corps. Now you notice that this is going to be the young guy in the group. This is the one that does um, motor spikes, the motorcycle type riding that's way, way too difficult for old people like me. <laughs> Joe Knox with us. He's from U.S. Forest Service. USDA, now I notice we're changing slightly. And brand new to this whole thing is Brunner Hill. He is the uh, recreation trails for BLM. Yeah, I'm the OHP park ranger for the BLM. We meet everybody. Which I didn't know we had. And then finally, if we let him have enough time, Ralph Files is going to talk to us about the OHP subcommittee and how they bring in those fee permit monies and turn them back around and give them out in grants. And that runs about $6 million a year. So you may want to hear about how much money that comes back to the Montrose area. Okay, let's go. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Renata. Okay. Um, hi, yeah, so I'm Renata Raziano. I'm the, um, the local committee chairperson for the Montrose Uncle Padre Trails uh, chapter of Cotmoba, which is the um, Colorado Plateau Mountain Bike Trail Association. I'm also the uh, Cotmoba Vice President. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Copnova, uh, it was founded in 1989. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to building, maintaining, and advocating for single track mountain bike trails on the Colorado Plateau here in Western Colorado. Um, our vision is to provide high quality, sustainable single track mountain bike trails for users of all ages and abilities, um, and providing outstanding recreation opportunities and improving the quality of life and economies of the communities we serve. Uh, we're governed by an, appo an appointed board of directors um, that come from local communities in Western Colorado. Uh, we're funded by individual membership fees, business membership fees, uh, donations, and grants. Um, we add, build and advocate for single track non-motorized trails. Um, and although we are a mountain bike group and we design and build trails with mountain bikes in mind, um, our, shares, our trails are shared trails um, and they are also used by hikers and uh, equestrians as well. Um, so Kukmova um, has four chapters on the western slope. Uh, there's the Grand Valley Canyons um, chapter, uh, that's for Fruta, Grand Junction, and Palisade. There's the Dam Group, which is the Delta Area Mountain Bikers. Um, and then the, the Ridgeway uh, Group is the Ridgeway Area Trails, or RAT. Um, so Cotmoba began um, 1989. This was Cotmoba's uh, first trail. It's the uh, nationally known Cocopelli Trail. 
This is a 142 mile trail that starts in Fruta um, and goes to Moab. Uh, most mountain bikers will do this over um, about the uh, course of about a three to five day trip. Um, since then, uh, Katmoba, the chapters of Katmoba have been very active in building trail systems um, all over the western slope. The Grand Valley Canyons chapter, um, they have the, uh, the Cocopelli Loops and North Fruta Desert um, trails in Fruta. They've been involved in the Lunch Loop trail system in Grand Junction. Um, the, the Gunnison Bluff trails that are um, um, off Highway 50 just south of Grand Junction and uh, on Grand Mesa the flowing park uh, trails, as well as uh, the Palisade Plunge. Um, the Delta chapter has been um, active um, in Hotchkiss. They built the crossroad trails at the high school there at Hotchkiss. They've developed a, um, a trail system at the county line trailhead of the Grand Mesa, where some of you may um, cross country ski in the winter. Um, and their big project that they're working on is a 50 mile trail system um, at Smith Mountain, um, which is at the northern end of the Sidewinder Trail in Delta. Um, the Ridgeway chapter several years ago completed um, their biggest trail system. They have a 32-mile uh, trail system that is off of uh, County Road 10 on the way to Owl Creek Pass, um, and they have uh, plans for more um, in Erie County. So our chapter, the local um, Mutt chapter, um, I'm going to tell you about the trails um, that we've been involved um, in bringing to Montrose. Um, Electric Hills Trail System, which is our current big project. Um, Buzzard Gulch, the Lower Spring Creek connectors, and also some city trails at City Summit, um, on city property at Sarah Summit and uh, River Bottom. So just a quick um, discussion here, like why does Montrose need non-motorized trails? Uh, Montrose has hundreds of miles um, of motorized trails um, that are open to mountain bikes, and that mountain bikes, we do ride some of these trails, but um, the trails that motorized users can ride and enjoy are not always the most enjoyable for mountain bikers, hikers, and equestrians. A lot of them have steep grades, um, loose rock and ruts. There also are um, not a lot of stacked loop systems that have distances that are suitable for mountain bikes. So, um, you know, Montrose does have many motorized trail systems, and within those there are certain trails and certain segments that um, are good for mountain biking, but we don't have large systems that are good um, for like a day or two of mountain biking. Um, so the non-motorized non trails, we can bring these to Montrose to offer local <coughs> residents opportunities for healthy outdoor recreation, as well as draw visitors um, to town who then spend money and help the local economy. Um, how do we build new trails? Um, we work with land with landowners and land managers, and we go through their process for approval and construction of new trails. So most of the time, this is a federal land agency, such as the BLM or the Forest Service, um, but it could also be um, city land, like the city of Montrose. Um, we don't do this by ourselves. We work with community partners to accomplish this. Uh, over the years, we've worked with the city of Montrose, Montrose County, the Rec District, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, as well as the local BLM office, the Uncle Padre Field Office. Um, and typically, our trail planning and construction is funded through either grants um, and volunteer labor. Um, so every year, we organize work days for trail cleanup, trail maintenance, um, and trail construction. Um, last year, we organized 17 work sessions for 85 volunteers, with 85 volunteers, accounting for about 736 volunteer work hours. Um, earlier this month, a couple weeks ago, uh, the BLM sponsored a weekend of trail, building, of trail building with the volunteers for Outdoor Colorado Group, um, which all combined 613 volunteer hours over two weekend days, making it our largest single weekend trail building volunteer event ever. Um, okay, so now I'll talk about the trails. Um, so first we'll start with uh, Buzzard Gulch. So this was um, built from 2011 to 2014. This was Montrose's very first um, non-motorized trail system. Um, it has about 12 miles of beginner to in intermediate single track, um, as well as some, some double track or like roads that have been closed. Um, this, um, <clears throat> this trail system is very popular, it sees heavy use. And um, the actual number one user of these trails are dog walkers. So not just mountain bikers, but lots of, lots of hikers. Um, so this is located um, west of Montrose. Um, the main trailhead is on Spring Canyon Road, which you can access, just follow Highway 90 out to Daywood Road, and then off of Popular and then Spring Canyon Road. Um, so just some pictures of the area. 
Um, you see, you know, what, what the terrain is like. It's kind of rocky, but still mostly beginner um, single track with some rocks thrown in. Um, next, I'll talk about the Lower Spring Creek connectors. Um, this is, um, these are two trails for a total of three miles um, that were built uh, with the CPW construction grant in 2016. These actually, these trails are here and here, and they're called connectors because they're connecting the Old Spring Canyon Road, which is an old road that's been closed and is not motorized, to the Lower Spring Creek uh, dirt bike trail. Um, so with these connector trails, we were able to form an 11 mile loop with the existing Lower Spring, Lower Spring Creek motorized single track. So um, before we had these connectors, um, if we wanted to mountain bike Lower Spring Creek, we had to bike about six or seven miles up the road on Dayton Road, which has gotten so busy now it's, they've actually paved it, um, was, uh, to access the Lower uh, Spring Creek um, Trail. So this has made um, a wonderful loop that's much more enjoyable uh, for mountain bikers. So these trails are located just um, south of Buzzard Gulch. They're accessible um, either at the Lower Spring Creek uh, Trailhead that they would access, or from the Buzzard parking lot going up uh, Spring Canyon Road. Um, and this is just a picture from those con uh, from one of the connector trails um, looking up, um, looking up Spring Canyon. Um, and then um, our current project, this is our biggest project um, to date, is the Electric Hills Trail System. Um, it's called Electric Hills because of the, the power lines um, that kind of uh, run through the landscape there where the trails are. Um, this is our first professionally designed and built non-motorized trail system. Um, this was built in cooperation with um, Montrose County um, and BLM. Uh, Montrose County has put over $100,000 into this project. Um, and the planning for this began in 2015. Uh, so I will say building trails on federal land is a long-term uh, process. So seven years later, we are now building out the trail system. So uh, when this is complete, there will be 17 miles of intermediate to advanced single track. Um, last, through last year and this year, we've got five miles that have already been built uh, by volunteers. Um, and this year, Mutt was awarded a $242,000 CPW grant uh, to pay for construction of the remaining 12 miles. Um, these trails will have a seasonal closure for wildlife from December 15th, I'm sorry, December 1st um, to April 15th. Um, so these trails are going to be accessible at the Rim Rocker Trailhead. So the Rim Rocker is a um, OHV trail that goes from, uh, from Montrose to Moab. Um, this trailhead is located um, off of Highway 90. You um, just take it all the way out past Shotman Valley and it turns to dirt. The parking lot will be there on the left. Um, and this is just a map of um, what the trails um, are going to look like when they're finished. Essentially, it's going to be um, a series of kind of stacked loops that offers um, numerous options um, for short rides and longer rides. Um, and in fact, these trails will also connect up to some um, ATV and double track trails um, that actually will, will, will go all the way over to Spring Canyon eventually. So, um, if you're interested at all in keeping up with the status of the trails and which trails um, are finished and ready to ride or hike, the best place to look for that is a website called mtvproject.com. If you search for Electric Hills, um, it will have the completed segments as well as the <coughs> number loading them onto the website. Um, so the trails here at Electric Hills are definitely a, a step up in difficulty um, from Buzzard Gulch. Um, the terrain um, is rockier. Um, it's very pretty. The trails go um, all the way up into Woodscott Canyon. Um, and this just gives you an idea of the nature of the trails. Um, so just quickly, some other um, projects, um, trails that uh, that Mutt has worked on um, with the city of Montrose. Um, we've created uh, a little trail system uh, up at Sarah Summit, east of town, right off Highway 50, where the sledding hill is. Um, we have four miles um, of single track there uh, with uh, more to come. Um, we've also worked with the city um, on sprucing up and putting some new trails at the river bottom, Cerise Park, Sunset Mesa area. Um, we also, there's a little pump track there and skills, a uh, little skills area. So just in summary, you know, Mud with Cotmoba, we're a volunteer organization that maintains and builds non-motorized single track, and we are a nonprofit that's um, creating infrastructure via trails that enhances the quality of life of Montrose residents and Wilson County. So thank you.
up on tires, cover all the hoses, belts, try to keep the sun off of it. They are expensive to maintain. And here we are hauling one. Uh, it could be going up on the hill or off of the hill. Uh, that's how we move it. We take them, try to move them off the mountain, keep the uh, marmots out of it. Marmots like to have fun inside a groomer. They can make quite a mess. Uh, there, as you can see, that looks like it could be uh, 90. Room behind it with a tiller. I believe that might be Mark Holly's head in there. And uh, when he gets done with that trail, it makes it really nice for snowmobiling. Uh, maintenance, um, they're always, see, every year they break down. And most of the maintenance is done by uh, members of our club. We have some pretty good mechanics in there. If it's something we can't handle, we'll have to call up Prenoth and we'll come down and finish whatever we can't handle. Uh, what our club uh, tries to do, uh, we promote responsible use of public lands and trails. Um, there is a groomer again, one of the groomers up at the Celeste Ranger Station. I think everybody should know where Celeste is. Uh, there is a, a, a um, ride schedule for snowmobilers every winter. Um, weather depends on the weather, not like our ATV schedule. We ride rain, snow, sleet, ATV, uh, snowmobiling. You're going to need a nice day. If you're going to ride in a blizzard, you might have about 10 feet of visibility. There is an ATV trip. Uh, we got a dog in there. Usually we have anywhere from six to 20 riders. We have an ATV schedule, a uh, summer ATV schedule with about 18 rides a year with some campouts. We do remote camping. Here is a uh, BLM project. Uh, Joe. Rob will be talking about this. He's going to be talking about play land loops and all, Joe, maybe. That is a 50 inch dozer for building 50 inch trails. Our club was involved with that uh, as swampers, moving branches, some rocks. That play land loops is right out of town over by Chavano Valley on Route 90. 50 inch trail. Uh, there's our crew, the club crew, uh, with loppers. We use chainsaws, clear logs, rocks. 
opening the trail up so we're not, some people complain about scratching our machine a little bit, but we like to keep a 50 inch wide trail. Okay, mushrooms. We have a mushroom picker in our club and he's still alive. So, we know these are good mushrooms. He likes to go up on the uh, Grand Mesa and uh, pick mushrooms. And he gets a couple baskets every year, freezes them, and puts them in his cheesesteak sandwiches throughout the year. And they are uh, palatable. Mm -hmm. Okay to eat. But I won't eat one unless he picks it. Here we are with the sand wands. Uh, if the bulldozer went through on one of our ATV rides. Uh, here we have Joe Knob, right here, and our Rich Dequino back here. And Joe and Rich and myself uh, have a, working on a project on Parallel Trail. And we're trying to get money very shortly, I hope, from a Yamaha, a Yamaha grant to improve this trail and bring in some rocks and road bedding so it doesn't wash out to keep it dry. Uh, there's a, a trailer that was funded by a grant from Polaris. This is up on Rubido. These are club members moving rocks, filling in a washout, and they move tons and tons of rocks. And you can see on the trailer, it says funded by Polaris Trails Grant, and that's one of the trailers, the only trailer that we own. And there's part of the pile of rocks that they threw in there, club members. And we weren't involved on the ties, but that's the same project up on Uber that way. And that was a washout. That trail kept washing, mountain kept washing down, filling in the trail. Nice picture here that Rich took, and you can see how we work with Colorado State Parks with uh, cooperation from the United States Department of Forestry there. And that, that sign is on Daywood Road. Uh, there's one of our club campouts. You can see we have a pretty good crew there, and we have lots of fun. We sit around and build a fire, chat, and hope the weather is good. We did have a camp trip in Utah, and that wind blew, and Utah, I don't even know if it's there now, it blew so hard. <laughs> There's another club camp out of our members. We have 150 plus members in our club. Largest in the state. <coughs> Largest in the state, yep. Yeah. And it, only ATV snowmobile club. Uh, also, uh, we're also members of CSA, Colorado Snowmobile Association. Colorado Snowmobile Association raffles off a snowmobile every year. Our club buys, buys and sells 600 tickets. The proceeds from those tickets, we donate to charity. Uh, this year, we donated $1,640 to Sherry Ministries and the Sheriff's Posse. And that's just about wraps it up for me. Frank, keep it short. Yes, Larry. We're funded by ourselves, the registrations on snowmobiles and ATVs. So touch our back. Yes, we're funded by ourselves. Uh, it comes through reg your registration sticker, thanks, Larry, on ATVs, snowmobiles, and dirt bikes. No cost to the taxpayers. And like I said, we maintain these trails, clean them, cut trees, move rocks, so everybody can enjoy it besides 18 beers and so forth. Thank you. That was yesterday we cleaned trail, and 11 of us cleaned, I don't know how many miles, 150 trees. How many trees did we do yesterday? 150 something. That's what the email said. I could tell you personally that my husband and I did 77 big trees and 28 little trees. It's really been mad up there because of the wind. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, okay, you know what you're doing? <laughs>
So I'll uh, see if I can pull up anything here. President of West Core, we um, basically were the dirt bikers that clear out the multi-user um, motorized single track in the area. We were a 501c3. We formed up in uh, 2017, and uh, we've got over 1,100 members in our group. We're based out of Montrose. Um, we maintain about 120 miles of single track, multi-user motorized single track. Um, that's been in uh, use since the early 80s, since the trail system came into effect. We're kind of on the south end of the plateau, and then we also clear trails up by uh, Silverjack Reservoir. There's some trails up there that we take care of. But uh, um, we've been doing the trail work for about 15 years now. Um, and then in 2017, we actually formed up and formed West Point. Kind of got organized. So um, I got a slideshow. I'll kind of narrate it. And then if you have any questions at the end, we'll be more happy to answer for you. This is up on the uh, Monarch Crest Trail over by uh, um, the Continental Divide, but this is basically what we do. Um, the trails that are out there, we clear and maintain them, we pack chainsaw on our backs, and clear out all the downfall timber every spring. Um, this is Alpine Trail up on, by Silverjack. This is a cleanup day we did um, for the, uh, the dog users out at Buzzard Gulch. There was a lot of uh, trash and dog poop out there, so we went out there and cleaned that up a couple years back. We've been kind of a little, little lower with COVID as far as organizing cut days, but this is on the south end of the plateau, um, clearing out some trails. This is out by um, the dump. There was a bunch of trash and stuff out there. We picked up, I think, over six tons of trash out in the uh, BLM lands. Um, Dennis Goodhue with Diamond G's came out and helped us quite a bit, but there was some people were shooting back there and stuff, and, and uh, just there's a whole lot of trash back there. But we've, uh, we like taking care of our backyard. It's uh, it's really great to be here, and, and uh, we want to keep it clean. This is uh, my buddy Chris Thomas. This is up on the south, southern end of the plateau. Um, this is some graffiti that some people put out uh, up by Flat Top. We went out and took care of that. Um, Jeremy Jones, RJ's painting, uh, donated the paint for that. We got the uh, paint coats and went out and just covered it up. You know, like I said, we like taking care of our stuff. So um, this is, uh, let's see, this is some uh, wood chips out at the Peach Valley OHB Recreation Area. We went out and spread, um, kind of get that ready for um, the summer riding season a couple years back. Um, with Morgan Spradling, Highland Cycles. We've got, like I said, we've got 1,100 guys. We've probably got about a dozen guys that run saw, but you can see the size of some of the logs that we, we run through. Um, it's just you know, the, really the only way we can kind of keep these trails open. Um, this is one of our trail bikes that we use. Um, this is out in the Adobe's. This is a bridge redeck we did a couple years back with uh, work with Joe out there. And, um, uh -oh. As you can see, the, the bridge was completely underwater, so we kind of redecked it and raised it up to get it over the bridge. And uh, now we've got a, a functioning bridge. Um, but, you know, when Joe was with the BLM, we worked with him and uh, got these projects done. Yamaha provided the, uh, the funding for the grants. Um, this is on the south end of the plateau again. This is primarily where we do most of our work. We've got about 100 miles of single track that we maintain up there and then a, another 30 or 40 up by Silver Jack that we take care of. Uh, this is out off the base of Simmons Mesa Road. Like I say, people are dumping trash back there and, you know, old abandoned trailers and stuff. And like I said, we just, we like taking care of our backyard and, and keeping it clean for all users. Uh, but yeah, we've collected over six tons of trash, um, you know, over the, the past couple of years and various cleanup days. But yeah, uh, I just, I just don't understand the mentality behind people on the trash on our backyard. Um, this is by Taylor Park over by Crestview. Um, the last couple of years of windstorms have just been really bad. This is uh, Sean Smith and his wife Amber. They do a lot of work for us. Um, this is one of the old bridges out in the Adobe's. That, uh, this is Joe that helped us rebuild a couple of years ago. Um, the uh, years drilling and uh, 
But um, yeah, it's just like I say, there's a lot of trail out there, and it uh, takes a lot of work. We like you know, like I say, none of this. Everybody shows up and does a little bit of work, and, and we get a lot done. Uh, it works out pretty well. But uh, it's it's uh, just takes a lot of work getting the manpower and the tools and the, like this this whole bridge we hiked it by hand. That was uh, that kicked my butt that day. Um, Joe and his crew when he was working with the BLM. Uh, this is up on Alpine Trail, um, south end of the plateau, having some good times. Uh, we do have an adopted trail agreement with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, this is on top of Alpine Trail um, that we're clearing south of the plateau. You can see some of the, the size of the trees. I mean, it just takes a, takes a fair bit of work to get through them. Um, that's, uh, yeah, it's Alpine Trail. That's Windy Point. Uh, Buddy jumped there. But, uh, it's, you know, on average, it takes us about two weeks um, solid to clear out every spring and it's we've been, been doing it for the last 15 years it's uh it's a lot of work but it's worth it you know it's really nice to be up there early spring and, and uh you know, taking care of stuff and getting it done some of the guys running the hands on us that's the hardest way to do it but it's the lightest way to pack gear in That's how we uh, carry the gear. We put it in the uh, Wattlin backpacks, and you can either carry it on the front of the bike or on the backpack. Most of us, you know, just kind of personal preference. But we also carry a little hands on so we can get through the smaller stuff without having to pull out the chainsaws. But we average about um, five to six hundred uh, cuts a year, you know, trunk cuts um, over all the trails that we do. Uh, this is on uh, Nate Creek. That's south end of the Plateau again. Uh, but like I say, it just takes a lot of manpower, a lot of people showing up, and you know, like I said, we do get a fair bit of people, and everybody shows up, just little, and does a little bit of work, we get a lot done. But uh, it's a fair bit of work, but we really enjoy doing it. Uh, thanks for your time. <laughs> earlier I'm Joe Knob. I'm with the Forest Service. I have an official job title as Trails Coordinator over there. Some of the pictures you saw earlier, I previously worked for the BLM. I did that for about four seasons, three or four seasons, and then a year ago I switched over to the Forest Service. Um, normally I start off my presentations or speeches one way, but I think I'm going to reverse it a little bit today. I just want to give you guys a little status of what it looks like out there, um, some plans for the season that we have going on. Um, we've been cutting out a lot of trees along with the volunteers, north end of the plateau and part of the south end of the plateau, especially the west, is still really wet, a lot of snow there, so we're going to be moving into Memorial Day weekend, just be aware of that, go with the buddy, make sure you're signing out with somebody, um, have a winch on if you can too. So I run for motorized three crews, we have two dozer crews and one OHV crew. This year we're going to start on the north end of the plateau on the 47 trail, bear pin trail, we're going to start moving south and we'll end up over in the Cimarron's on um, the West Fork Trail, Lou Creek, Fox Creek, Tim, all that there. Um, not motorized through the Great American Outdoors Act, we go out we call funds. We're going to be spending a lot of money and time down in the uh, San Juans this year on the Blue Lakes Trail, on the Dallas Trail, and then um, on the Horse Thief Trail. I'm really trying to work hard to get the Blue Lakes Trail reconstructed, it's washing out, it's really hard, especially when it's wet out there um, to hike up that trail. But now I think I'll just go into talking about the volunteers a bit here. Um, they're the backbone of every program I have, whether it's motorized or non-motorized. They're there to support me, they're there to lend a hand. Anytime I ever need help, they're always there. It's all hands on deck. Uh, you saw a lot of what they've gotten done, what they continue to get done. And they keep these trails open. They advocate for new trails, for these trails to stay open, for them to be accessible, and all sorts of things. On uh, my OHV presentations every year, I do approximately 2,100 hours that they give to the OHV every year. And I know that that's short. Usually that's because I have to put a guesstimate out there before um, I get the actual data that comes in. So I can't thank them enough. Um, they're awesome to work with. They're fun people and they get a lot of work done. 
They're really hard workers. Do you have any questions about trails or status of trails or what's going on? Please uh, catch me after. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, once again, my name is Brenner Hill, I'm the BLM OHV Park Ranger. Uh, pretty new to this position, I've worked for the BLM for a couple seasons in Montana and here in Colorado and I've been in this position for about two months now, so I'm really excited to be here. And, uh, like Joe said, just working with the volunteer groups has been great and I'm really excited to do more of that this year. And that, like Joe said, that really is the backbone of the fall our trails and trail work that, that is happening out here. And, I also just want to touch on the OHV registration dollars really make my job and me and my crew getting out there possible and maintaining trails and ideally building new trails. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna be doing a lot of work out in Peach Valley this year and Dry Creek and uh, hope to see a lot of you out there. And once again, thanks. And oh, I did want to say, uh, I don't want to speak for Joe, but we did have a really uh, difficult time this year hiring. So if you do know people that you think might be interested in riding UTVs and dirt bikes, so please send them our way because um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do and unfortunately not a lot of people uh, <laughs> were able to apply or, or come to our direction. So I'm excited to see you out there. Thank you. Thank you. Renata, will you help me with my, put my thing back in? Okay, Ralph. Ralph Files is with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife OHV Subcommittee. And we're going to, we just want to show, he wants to show you some numbers. And he leads me to the, yes, we're moving down one of the people. Uh, type one. Hold on, okay, we'll go with the one. Sorry, I, I'm not littering. Over the years, I've been involved, I guess, first of all, with COTMOBA for a number of years, uh, which is now the MUT, and involved with them. I uh, helped build quite a few trails at Bridgerton, and <clears throat> then into uh, the OHV committee, community. Um, to start off with, uh, I had no aspirations of ever being on the OHV subcommittee. A friend of mine from uh, Thunder Mountain Wheelers, who I'd worked with quite a bit through Forest Service, uh, approached me one day and said, how about being on this committee? And I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And he said, well, all you have to do is go to two meetings in Denver a year. Yeah. One of them is two days, <laughs> and the other is one day. Well, he for neglected to tell me that you end up with close to 100 uh, presentations and uh, papers that you have to read on requests for money. <laughs> and that, <laughs> usually you get that about the middle of December and it's uh, a reading marathon to figure out and try to take, keep track of who wants what and whether they're doing the jobs that you want them to do out there on the ground, um, etc. With the committee being uh, about eight members, and they're from most of the areas of Colorado that uh, have OHV trails. And consequently, they're um, well-versed in what's happening in their own region. And it, it, the committee really depends on that. Uh, over the years that I've been on this committee, this is going to be my last one coming up, it has been it, it very enlightening to me. Um, getting to see what does happen out there on the ground, uh, who's involved, where the money goes, etc. OHV funds come in from $25.25 from OHV users. In other words, if you're gonna be out on any public lands and you don't have a permit and you're running a, a, some type of OHV, they can find you pretty heavy. And what this, how this came about was the people 
that were out there riding and said, you know, we're not getting money back to be able to keep maintain our trails. And so the OHB community got together and said, you know, we can afford about $25 a year, but we want some real strong commitments out of CPW as to how that money is spent. There is a very low percentage that can be used on uh, administration, and the rest of it has to go on the ground someplace. This uh, has been very interesting. Um, this year, instead of uh, four and a quarter million that we usually hand out, we ended up giving out about 6.5 million to go back on the ground, organizations, um, clubs, <coughs> and directly to Forest Service and BLM. When Joe was talking about the uh, cats that he has out, the two of them, they're used all over um, the G Club. In other words, they'll spend some time probably in Denison, definitely in uh, Grand Mesa, and in Montrose, the uh, Ray Ranger District, and also in uh, uh, the, uh, the Norwood District. So this gives you a kind of an idea of the Western Slope, where that money went, where it's going. It'll be a year out. They won't get this money this year, but they'll get it in 23, in most cases. Uh, so you can see for the Western Slope, we picked up 1.7 million to get trails done. Our biggest problem at the present time, as far as the committee's concerned, et cetera, is that the Forest Service, clubs, et cetera, are having a terrible time trying to hire people to do work on the ground. And that's mostly because of bureaucracy, but also because of the downturn uh, that we have in, uh, because of COVID in getting people back out on the ground. Sometimes they will hire young people and they look it up, see what is going to have as far as um, housing is concerned, and housing turns out to be the killer because they can't afford to live here and work on $15 an hour for six months. Anyway, this committee, um, in most cases, we hand out the money, and in the last three years, uh, about 20% of that money comes back because nobody can hire people to do the work on the ground. And it makes it a real mess as far as taking care of the money to um, you know have that money coming back in. We you know we're charged with making sure that money goes on the ground and is spent appropriately. Out of about 68 requests this year for the state, uh, we ended up not funding three uh, requests because it didn't quite fit our criteria. Um, it's uh, been very enlightening as to be out there on the ground. Thank you. This one's interesting because it shows you that's the Montrose region. That's the 1,717, whatever the number was. And you see it's a good chunk of the state of Colorado that gets this money. So it's really important to have that. And, it, and it's nice to have the funding that comes in to do that. Okay. I think that's it. Let's ask questions. and do that type of thing. So, who has a question? Uh, great presentation. Um, Ralph, you said that 20% uh, of the money is goes unspent because it, you can't get the labor to do that. What, what happens to that money? Does it go to, to uh, backup projects? 
Um, do you hold it over for next year? What, what happens with that money? Uh, usually it comes back in and is uh, set to put back out sometimes in the same year. Um, if somebody has a project that comes up, a washout, a fire, or whatever, some of that money goes back directly to those. It's okay. And uh, definitely the money is all still spent on the ground because by our by state law, actually, that money has only a very small amount can go to uh, things other than being on the ground down here. Question. Okay, so uh, my question would be, uh, for instance, the single track non-motorized had a grant for 242000 almost a quarter of a million dollars uh, spent. But what, what do they contribute to earn that like we as motorized do as far as our registrations for snowmobiles is 30 or 35 per machine, ATVs are 25 per machine. That all goes back into what we're getting out of it. My question is what, uh, what or can we assist those uh, single track non-motorized in getting their funds or um, having them, besides just volunteerism, having them contribute to their trails in a financial manner. Does that yeah, make any sense? So, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of discussion about this recently, um, especially given, um, you know, most of our money um, for the trails comes from, I guess, I think it comes from like uh, state park fees, but also the CPW funding, which is a lot funded by hunters, um, right. by, hunt, by not, hunting and fishing. That's not fair to them. Yeah, so there's, um, and there's also a desire for us, like if you hear the, the motorized, they, what, you had like 60 some applications, they didn't fund three. When we apply for a construction grant, there's a, a third of the programs get funded. Um, and so we want, as users, um, we feel like the time has come to, you know, we need to be contributing to this. There needs to be a bicycle sticker yes. or a hiker sticker or something like that. Um, and that is what we're looking to move towards as well. CPW would like that because as their funding dollars go down from hunting and fishing, yeah. they need um, to replace that. So there is some discussion that was, um, I would think in the next five years there's going to be something somewhat like that. I, I know, I think recently they initiated, um, when you renew your, is it your driver's license or your car registration? You can get a state parks pass for like 20 bucks or something when you do that. And so they're trying to make it easier for people. So that's one way they're trying to increase funding. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see um, another type of trail user fee for non-motorized users coming along. So where do the e-bikes fall under? You or under the motorized, and are they registered? <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm totally blank so, on that. So no, so they're, so they're not. They're um, they're sort of in between because they're not motorized, but they have a motor. Um, yeah. <laughs> currently, by U.S. by the Forest Service and BLM um, considers them motorized vehicles, but they're um, also sort of in their own category where they're going to be um, considered for trail use, sort of like what trails they, they can go on. I believe on a case by case. Uh, basis. But um, there's no fee on their use no. yet either. Okay. No, there's no fee on that. Gotcha. Some of the discussion this last uh, couple months on fees has been uh, when you buy your drive, when you buy your license for your car, you have a couple of outs. Right now you can have an out so you don't have to pay for um, a sticker to go into the state parks that would be coming up definitely but also possibly for trail use so anytime you uh, you can opt out and I'm not sure what you know there's still discussion on how much they'd like to have for that it could be as low as five dollars it could be as high as twenty dollars mm -hmm. yeah with all trails that's for equestrians hikers everybody <coughs> yeah. so I hope that comes to Fruition. Yeah. Thank you. Joe, would you like to address Eva? Uh, she really, she's <coughs> really, they're their own class. <coughs> heads. Yeah, we view them as, um, yeah, but it, it's a little bit different with the state and the feds. So, I mean, she did a very good job of really addressing that one. Questions? 
I hear you guys talk about trails, and that's great, but isn't there a lot of off-trail use and trail use that is not authorized and causes a lot of damage and whatnot? Okay, Joe, that must be you. Well, you can kind of speak, I guess, a little bit for me on, too, though. Yes. The runner. Um, yeah, there is a tremendous amount of off-trail use. Uh, we do have, we partner with a group called Stay the Trail. They're, they usually try to come out once a year out here to try to inform the public, uh, people going out there using these trails to stay on the trails. But um, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent, and these user groups can also chime in too, up on the forest as it is on the BLM. It's a tremendous amount when I worked there on BLM. It's really nice too with the Peach Valley area. It's an open area where there are no designated trails and you can go wherever you want. Um, please utilize that. It's that's what it's meant for. Otherwise, please stay on the trails. Please try not to make them wide. It's supposed to be 36 inches wide. Um, some of them on the LM are easily up to six to seven feet. Yeah, and all I'll say about that is we do our best to put up signs, you know, saying this is not a designated trail or no vehicles because they start by someone doing what they want and going off the trail. And then when people see that, they assume it's a trail, and it's just a trickling snowball effect. So I do my best, my crew does our best to get out there and find these trails and put a signage on them to let people know this is not a trail. And once it's, you know, ideally once it's reclaimed um, and it doesn't look like a trail anymore, we take those signs out. So we do our best, but like Joe said, it is very prevalent in Beach Valley and on um, BLM in general. We are aware of that. On most grant requests, a large or part of it anyway is for maintaining those trails or taking those trails out that have been added that are not supposed to be. Many years ago, I'm thinking 20, 25 years ago, a group of kids came to um, Montreal City Council and wanted to put in a skateboard park. And the city said, we'll talk about this, but you as kids, you have to give us back something. So let's talk about if we put in a skateboard park, that you will use it. You will not be taking your skateboards and riding the rails on the front of the county courthouse. You will not be on Main Street. You will not be tearing up because they do do some damage. Because you will have your skateboard park. And believe it or not, the kids agreed. And they and their parents worked. They raised lots of money. They put in that skateboard park that's down in um, Baldrige Park. And I think it was a tremendous thing to have done. They realized if they wanted something, they had to give up that. And if you, you think about it, you don't see skateboards downtown. You don't see the damage like we were seeing before that. So my feeling is a little bit about if we can get more people to be involved in these volunteer organizations and help get things done, we'll have fewer of the, I'm gonna go do my own thing. So we just need to encourage people to get involved. Sorry, that was my soapbox. Another question? be a quick question because we're almost out of time but what happens to the trees that you cut down do you what where, where do they go yeah that, basically yeah. As, as far as the uh, the trees that we cut you know like a lot of our wet aspens and stuff they can weigh a couple hundred pounds and we basically just push them off the side of the road or the side of the trail where we're clearing we don't have the ability to transport a couple hundred pounds worth of a tree chunk so, I mean, we basically just get it off the trail as, as uh, cleanly as possible to allow the, you know, for use for the trail, you know, for people to use the trail and not catch a snag or anything like that. But yeah, they basically just go off the side of the road. We don't have any way to transport. And as somebody pointed out to me once, it also helps to keep people on the trail. So, if you've got these barriers on both sides of the trail, you can still see the beauty on the other side, but you're not so much into driving out there. And that's for us, that's why it's so important for us to be up there early season to clear the trails so all user groups can get out there. Because when the trees are down, 
people just go around. They don't turn around and go back to the truck. They just go around. It's the path of least resistance. So the, the quicker we get those trees cleared out, the more people stay on the trail and, and they're not causing reroutes and, and damage you know, going, by going off trail or around the down trees. So that's, that's kind of why we like to get it down there as early as possible. So thank you, you six people. Thank you for showing up this morning, being organized, getting this done. It was great to hear about that, everything from the trash pickup to what we can do to help fund all of this. So thank you very much. Now, let's have Phoebe tell us about next week. You guys are going to think we planned this because I'm sitting back there.